Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Dean Blocker. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, full disclosure, I got in late last night, so I didn't get the memo that you're supposed to start with a joke. <laughs> However, as a violist, I have been the butt of many jokes. So what is the difference between a violin and a viola? You got it, yes. <laughs> All right, I got another one. Why did the violist marry the monkey grinder? Upward mobility. <laughs> All right, one more, one more, just one more. How do you get a dozen violists to play in unison? Yes, shoot 11 of them. Very good. <laughs> Actually, not long ago, I actually, I went to the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Um, I've been a journalist for many years, and I was covering the World Economic Forum, and I'm on the plane, and I happen to be sitting next to a rather esteemed American conductor of one of our larger symphony orchestras, and I was very excited, and I turned to him to introduce myself, and I said, I'm a violist, and he says, I'm sorry. <laughs> so... Anyway, viola is an awesome instrument, awesome instrument. Anyway, I am really delighted to be here with you. It is such an honor and a privilege for me to be able to speak with music teachers and with musicians, and I'm especially delighted with the topic that we're talking about today, which is how music can help your students lead, you know, how music can lead to success for your students, regardless of what path they choose, whether it's music or something else. And I stand here before you as really an accidental advocate for music education. I became one only recently in the course of writing the book, Strings Attached. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, but it, it tells the story of my own childhood music teacher. Um, a man who changed the lives of thousands of students, including mine. And what Strings Attached turned into as we were writing it, really, it's a love note. It's a love note to music education. And it's especially a love note to music teachers. And it's a rallying cry that music education isn't a luxury. It is a necessity. Now, what I'd like to do today is pass along some of the lessons that I've learned, both in reporting the book, but also, and more importantly, since then. Um, it, I've gone around the country, I've spoken and met with lots of people like yourselves. And in a couple of minutes, I'm gonna walk you actually through some specific findings and some ideas for advocacy and action um, that I've come across. Um, but let me just start, uh, to go back to the beginning, to explain sort of how I got to, to be here, to become an advocate. Um, you know, it started with a book, and the book started, actually, this was a few years ago. Uh, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that went viral that was about the death of my childhood music teacher. Now, I grew up in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and went to public schools, and my music teacher, he was a man named Jerry Kupchinski. We all called him Mr. K, because we couldn't pronounce his name, and he was this fierce Ukrainian immigrant orchestra conductor. So this is the guy who, if anybody in the orchestra plays out of tune, he stops the whole group and he would scream, who is idiot who played wrong note? <laughs> he was terrifying. Um, but he was so effective, so effective. And, you know, he was also a teacher who I lost touch with after I graduated from high school. I actually came here to Yale. Um, he had prepared me so well on the viola that I actually qualified for lessons here at the Yale School of Music as an undergrad, and I played all four years in the symphony. But I'd lost touch with that teacher, and after I left Yale, I stopped playing. I went to the Wall Street Journal and spent many years there. And decades passed, and my viola was someplace. I didn't, you know, I, my kids didn't even know I played it. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I get um, a, a message that this teacher, Mr. K, has passed away. And it hit me like that proverbial ton of bricks, that this is a man who made all the difference in my life, who changed my life. And that even though I no longer play the instrument that he taught me, I use the lessons that I learned in his classroom 
every single day. Things like perseverance, focus, resilience. And I realized I, I needed to go back. I felt compelled. I had to go back to my hometown. Um, there, were, there was going to be a little memorial concert played by some alums. And I said, I have to be there. I have to be a part of it. I have to play in it. I didn't even know where my viola was. I actually had to go digging through my closets. I finally found it. I open it up. I am greeted, I'm not kidding, by this explosion of bow hair because the whole thing was infested by mites. So um, anyway, I got it cleaned up, got a new case. Um, and, uh, and I went back to my hometown literally thinking I am a crazy person for feeling this way. But I walked in for this little rehearsal before this memorial concert. I walked in for the little rehearsal beforehand, and I see 40 years worth of former students who have flown in from every corner of the country, all of them with their old instruments in tow, all of them who felt exactly as I did. And when the curtain rose on our memorial concert that day, we had created a symphony orchestra the size of the New York Philharmonic. It was the most moving experience I had ever had. And I ended up writing this little piece in the Times. And the reason that it went viral is because so many people read that and said, I have someone like that in my own past. And we started getting all sorts of emails and, and letters from people. And Mr. K's um, daughter, uh, Melanie Kopchinski, she and I are the same age, and we grew up together. We grew up playing in a string quartet together. She was a real prodigy, a violinist, and she's actually been for a long time a violinist now with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And Melanie and I both started getting all of these beautiful stories and letters, and ultimately that was the impetus for us to write. We, we paired up to write the book um, Strings Attached. Now, the thing is, as we were writing the book, and um, I did a lot of reporting, we realized that so many of Mr. K's students had gone on to great success in other fields. There were doctors, lawyers, college professors, lots of music teachers. Um, and I started doing research, and I noticed that there were all sorts of accomplished people in other fields who also started as musicians. So then, as a journalist, I started calling them all up and interviewing them. And that resulted in a piece um, in the New York Times. They put the headline on it, is music the key to success? Which, of course, the answer, duh. I mean, hello, of course it is. <laughs> um, but for that piece, I spoke to so many people, like Alan Greenspan, the former chair of the Federal Reserve, who actually was a clarinetist who studied at Juilliard and was a professional musician playing in a jazz band um, before he became an economist. Um, I spoke with Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press, who went to school um, as a French horn major. Chuck Todd, actually, he grew up in Florida. This was awesome. He, when I talked to him, he was principal French horn player in the Florida All-State Orchestra. And as I was talking to him, the guy's a busy man, right? But he went into excruciating detail about this one audition he had when he was 16, and the judges marked him wrong, and he's still upset about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I also spoke to Paula Zahn, also the broadcaster. She went to school on a cello scholarship. And, and more recently, I actually, I recently met Andrea Mitchell, the NBC uh, Washington correspondent. And it turns out she started out as a child prodigy violinist and expected to have a career in music, only discovered broadcasting by mistake. She was in a practice room at the University of Pennsylvania, and they were broadcasting down the hall. They had the, the, um, the, uh, the university's classical music radio station, and she went over to investigate and discovered broadcasting. Um, and I also met, the other one that I met recently was Larry Page, the co-founder of Google. This is fascinating. He was a saxophone player. And he um, actually credits music with, with founding Google. He actually gave an interview very recently to Fortune magazine, and he talks about 
how he was designing a program as a teenager to build a music synthesizer, and he discovered that this major weakness with most software and with most hardware in the computer systems was their inability to perform in real time. And as he said, in music, you are very cognizant of time and real time. And he said that was the key to Google. He became obsessed with response time. And that is why the whole basis of the Google search engine is that it gives you answers instantly. It all came from music. So while I was writing this piece, I asked all of these people, you know, what is it about music? Is there a connection between music training and your success? And Every single one of them said, absolutely, yes, there is. And they talked about some very similar things. They almost all talked about the idea of discipline, the idea of learning to work with others. They, they, they almost all talked about playing in an ensemble and how that teaches you to work in a group. They talked about focus, attention to detail. And the thing they talked about the most, which I find fascinating because it's lacking in society today, is they said, it taught them how to listen, something that's exceedingly rare now. So that piece in the Times became one of the most emailed pieces of the entire year in the newspaper because clearly it resonated well beyond you know, people like us in this room and beyond musicians and music teachers to a larger audience. So that tells us something that, that people understand um, the importance of music and what music can do for you. But I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand the mechanism of what is it exactly about music that translates into success. So I began scouring the academic research and I spoke with neuroscientists and psychologists and economists. And I ended up writing this piece in the, in the Wall Street Journal that Michael referred to that looked at the connection between music and academic performance. And I want to share with you just um, briefly five major findings that came out of this research. And the first is, none of you will be surprised by this, music raises your IQ. Um, there was a University of Toronto psychologist who, who did this study of first graders and he randomly assigned them to either keyboard, singing, or drama lessons, or a focus group that got nothing. And I spoke to this researcher and he said to me, he said, I came into this as a skeptic because uh, everybody talks about how great music is. I figured if you gave the kids any kind of lesson outside of school, it's gonna boost their IQ. So he was really surprised when the results showed that the music students had the biggest bump and by far larger than any other group in their verbal IQ after just 20 days of music instruction. In fact, the increase was five times that of a group that was given visual art lessons. And the researchers who were studying these children also found that um, the, the, those who had music lessons, it enhanced what's called the executive function of the brain, which is the brain's ability to plan, to organize, and to strategize, which of course is, is essential to success in the classroom. Um, a second finding, music training can reduce the academic gap between rich and poor school districts. Um, there's a program that some of you may be aware of called the Harmony Project, it's in LA. It gives free instrument lessons um, to students in poor neighborhoods. And the woman who founded the program noticed that children who went through this program ended up doing better in school. They had a higher graduation rate and more of them attended college. And so there was a Northwestern University neurobiologist who came in to study what was going on here. And so she spent two years tracking this six to nine year old group of kids and then used sophisticated measurements to actually measure their brain activity. And what she found was there was a significant increase in the music student's ability to process sounds, which is key to language, reading, and focus in the classroom. And so the Northwestern neurobiologist then did a similar study, this one of high schoolers, and she did it in impoverished neighborhoods in Chicago. And this was done with high schoolers, and half the high schoolers were given some sort of music training, and the other half were, were given um, an ROTC program. 
And um, what she found was that those who were in the music program showed a significant increase, again, in their abilities to process sound. And she said this is so important because particularly, um, you know, in a neighborhood where you may have, um, you know, an inner city neighborhood where you've got some troubles in the schools and difficult classrooms, it's so important for the kids to be able to focus um, on that teacher and what they're saying and on their schoolwork. So, um, that leads directly to number three, which is music is and can be an inexpensive screening tool for reading and learning disabilities. This one came about by accident. There was a, a wonderful music teacher, school room, classroom music teacher in Brazil, and he gave this very, very simple rhythm and pitch test to his second graders. Using his guitar, he would just play chords and like have them repeat rhythms, and he noticed that apropos of, he wasn't looking for this, but he noticed that the kids who did poorly on this test ended up having difficulties later in learning how to read. And he paired up with a Harvard Medical School professor who came in and studied these kids, and they found that it was definitive, that these children who had difficulty with these music and pitch and rhythm tests early on um, it, was a, it was extremely predictive of learning disabilities. And so they've actually gone on to develop this program, and it's terrific because it cost virtually nothing, and yet they're able to diagnose and help these children earlier. So four, music training does more than sports, theater, and dance to improve key academic skills. Now, I love all these extracurriculars, don't get me wrong, my kids have been involved in all of them, they're fantastic. Um, but the German Institute for Economic Research actually did a study comparing these. They, uh, they did a study of 3,000 teenagers, 17-year-olds, uh, and they compared music training with sports, theater, and dance um, to see you know, what, were the, what were the differences. And they found that those who had taken music lessons scored significantly higher in terms of cognitive skills, they had better grades, they were more conscientious, and they were more ambitious than their peers. And the interesting thing about this is this impact um, was more than twice that of other activities, and this is really important. It didn't matter what the socioeconomic background of the child was. It helped the kids no matter in what area they came from. So, I mean, the other activities, to be sure, I have to say this, I have a daughter who's a dancer, um, <laughs> all the other activities were good too, music was just better. Um, and finally, five, music literally expands your brain. Uh, there is a 2009 study that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience where researchers used this MRI to study the brains of six-year-olds before and after they had 15 months of uh, musical instrument training and lessons. And they found that this, the students' brains grew larger in all of the areas that control fine motor skills and auditory processing, um, and that the students' abilities in those areas also improved. And interesting, they also found that the corpus callosum, which is um, the part of the brain that connects the left brain and the right brain, also grew. And this has been shown with other musicians that they have many more neural connections between left and right brain. So um, the, uh, I think perhaps given all of those findings and more, uh, perhaps we should not be surprised that the number one major of students accepted into medical school is not biology, it's music. In fact, Columbia University, someone just sent me their, their current alumni magazine has a piece about um, about its medical students noting that one-third of its med students are musicians, including students who actually have gone through Juilliard, like very accomplished musicians. And the piece quotes the dean of the medical school, um, who says musicians make great doctors, and I'm gonna quote him. He said, if you're a musician, you've got to listen, you've got to watch, you've got to be very involved and observant, these traits matter. If you're attuned to what other people are doing, you're going to be a better doctor. So this piece of the journal, as Michael mentioned, also went viral because clearly there are people you know, beyond us, beyond educators and musicians, beyond converts like me, uh, who realize that if you really care about improving American education, music is a pathway there. 
And I feel like my own teacher, Mr. K, um, you know, he passed away before any of this research was done. But I really feel like he knew this intuitively, and I also feel like he passed that along to us, to his students. And I think all of us, all of us students, everyone in this room, we all know the importance of what you guys do. Um, and I've spoken, since the book came out a, a bit a while ago, I've spoken about this. One of the most heartbreaking things that I have heard is um, about music programs being cut because they're not considered core academics. Frankly, if music isn't core, I don't know what is. Um, and yet, music programs continue to face these, these issues. Um, there, was a, there was an analysis in the Journal of Economic Finance that actually looked at what does a music program cost. And it calculated that a K through 12 school music program in a large suburban district costs just $187 per student per year which was 1.6% of the total education budget, which seems to me a small price to pay for something that has this many benefits. But as I've gone around talking around the country, I've also seen some incredible success stories, and really I've met so many incredibly inspiring teachers, people like you guys. And I want to touch on um, just three best practices that I've come across in terms of music advocacy, in terms of, of making people aware of the importance of music education. And some of this comes from you know, what I noticed in writing the book from my own teacher, Mr. K, and some of it from some of these teachers who I've been meeting with um, since the book came out. Um, the first thing is that the, these teachers get students involved in music very, very early on. Um, my own teacher, Mr. K, we, in my district, we had started music lessons in fifth grade. And he had, in fourth grade, every single student in the district took a music aptitude test. It lasted about 15 minutes. And then every single student in the district got a personal letter from him. And if you scored really well on the music aptitude test, you got a personal letter from him that said, you scored really well on the music aptitude test. We recommend that you take a string instrument. And even if you failed, <laughs> you got a personal letter from him that said, we really think you'd enjoy a band instrument. <laughs> he had a very high participation rate of kids taking lessons. Um, the second thing that these teachers do is they expose the children in their music programs to the community and to administrators. And there's a couple of ways to do this. I mean, in the case of Mr. K, he had us play everywhere. We were constantly perform. We would perform anywhere and everywhere. You know, there's like a, a, a school, you know, street, oh, there's a street fair, right? I remember this, this was like a horror show. It was a, there was, they were doing a colonial street fair and I was 13 and he's like, okay girls, dress up like colonial people and go play on the street, which was just excruciating. But, but the fact is, we, <laughs> um, the fact is we played everywhere and he would take us around and he would take us to you know, festivals, anywhere where we could be out in public. And it was great for us because we were constantly preparing for performances, which was one way to keep us all engaged. There was a very, very low dropout rate because we were always preparing for something else exciting. And we were always um, auditioning for you know, regional and all state and all of those. So we were always had something on the horizon we were working toward, but we were doing it in public. And he always would invite like a local newspaper reporter, a local photographer, to make sure that we were in like the little local newspaper so everybody knew what we were doing. And uh, it was really great um, for that. And, um, but, but I see, you know, in, in more recent times, I see a lot of um, t music teachers who have done a great job of doing this as well. Um, they're great, I think, especially at getting the kids in the face of, of, of administrators. Uh, which I think is also incredibly important, um, and exposing the whole community. So I'll give you one example. I think we have some people from Ithaca here, right? Is there, yay, okay, so my son just, we may have met because my, my son recently graduated from Cornell, which is in Ithaca, and he's a French horn player, and he played in the symphony all four years, and for his last concert, they did something I'd never seen before. I've since learned that um, probably a lot of you guys do this. 
they had um, a very family-friendly program uh, of West Side Story Suite they played. And um, they had beforehand, they invited the, they advertised it throughout Ithaca, and beforehand they had what they called an instrument petting zoo. So they had this tremendous influx of people from the community all bringing their children, and then the, the musicians, the college musicians, all came out into the lobby, and they brought teeny little violins and drums, and they, so you had the big kids showing the little kids um, these instruments, and it was just the most beautiful sight. And I believe there was also, there were some local teachers there, maybe you guys were there, and there were also some, um, there was also like the, the place where you can rent the, the company, the rental company, also set up there. And it was just such a great thing, and I thought, what an amazing thing to be able to expose these little kids and get them excited, and what better way to get them excited than for them to, to get all this attention paid to them by the big kids. Um, it was just sort of a brilliant, extraordinary um, moment. And then, you know, third, I want to make just the, the, the final point here um, that I've noticed is, is how important it is for teachers to learn how to advocate within their own school district. It's just not enough anymore just to do a good job and expect to be noticed. It's really important to advocate for your program. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with just a story that blew me away. I was so inspired by this, by this one amazing school teacher who I met. Um, this teacher happened to be in East Brunswick, New Jersey, my hometown. Um, Melanie, my co-author, and I had, you know, we'll, we'll go around to schools and, and talk about music, and, and we visited a middle school uh, in East Brunswick. And the music teacher there um, had this phenomenal program. She only had two grades, and yet she had three orchestras and in three different levels, one of whom played with us, and we were just blown away by how great this was. And it turned out this music teacher, uh, she's younger than I am, but she too had been a student of Mr. K back in the day and grew up to kind of take on his music program and continue it and improve it. It was just remarkable. And Melly and I said to her, how do, how do you do this? Like, what is your secret? And she told us a couple of things that I think are worth passing on, and some of you probably have done some of this stuff yourself as well. Um, the first thing she said to us was that she lobbied the administration to make orchestra an honors course because um, the, the best students, they all want to take the honors courses because you can get better than a 4.0, and they didn't want to take orchestra because it was bringing down their GPA. And she was able to convince the administration to make orchestra an honors course, which meant that there were all these wonderful students who she would have lost otherwise who now wanted to be in orchestra. And then the second thing she did, which I also blew me away, it was just so creative, was she, had, she actually she took Strings Attached, our book, um, which I highly recommend, but you could use another book. <laughs> um, but she put Strings Attached into the curriculum. She had the students read the book, and she created an essay test around it. Um, and what that did is it suddenly made her orchestra course count toward Common Core for English and literature. And by the way, she shared some of the essays with us that these students had written. And they were really, it was so moving to see because what she's doing is she's not only providing this great musical experience to the kids and giving them a really high level music training, but what she's doing is exposing them to the importance of music education. Um, and it's really something, you know, beyond just how to play the technical aspects of how to play music. It's really sort of the larger context of why this counts, what's important, and it's something that they're going to carry um, with them for the rest of their lives. I should mention, you know, I mentioned this um, Cornell program, and, and this teacher reminded me of this as well. Uh, De Dean Blocker mentioned earlier about how some of these students are going to go on to other things. And um, at this Cornell concert, the conductor, a guy named Chris Kim, wonderful symphony conductor at Cornell, um, he turned to the audience at one point. And in the program, they give you, uh, they list the kids and they tell you their major. And there's not a single music major in the Cornell Symphony Orchestra. They are, they're like scary things. They're like electro neurobioengineering. Like it, it's stuff I don't even get what they are. They're all either pre-med or engineering, almost all science. And, um, and he turned to the audience and he said, I have great optimism 
about the future of music in this country, and it's because of this orchestra. Because none of these people are gonna be musicians, but every one of them, they're going to have their children take lessons. They're gonna be subscribers to the symphony. They're gonna be patrons, they're gonna be board members. And, and it gives me great hope. And, and um, I was really heartened by that um, because I really feel like that is, you know, the one thing. Some of our students are going to go on and be brilliant musicians and end up here at the Yale School of Music and go on to be performers, but the vast majority of them will go on to other things, and music is going to help them every step of the way. And that was the goal for me in writing Strings Attached, um, and it's the goal of my speaking with you today and meeting with people around the country. And I know it's the goal of everybody in this room, which is that we really do need to raise our voices so that the rest of the country hears us as well, that politicians and school boards and voters all understand that music education changes lives. So thank you. <laughs>